Still carrying the child, he led them down the hill towards the largest of the clusters of huts, and he stooped through the opening in the matting fence. The yard was bare and swept, the circle of huts facing inwards. There were four women working in a group, all of them wearing only loincloths of coloured trade cotton. They rocked on the balls of their feet, singing softly in chorus, stamping and crushing the raw dried maize in tall wooden mortars, their bare breasts jerking and quivering with each stroke of the long poles they wielded as pestles in time to their chant. One of the women shrieked when she saw Hendrik and rushed to him. She was an ancient crone, wrinkled and toothless, her pate covered with pure white wool. She dropped on her knees and hugged Hendrik's thick, powerful legs, crooning with happiness. My mother, said Hendrik, and lifted her to her feet. Then they were surrounded by a swarm of delighted, chattering women. But after a few minutes, Hendrik quieted them and shooed them away. You are lucky, Manny, he grunted with a sparkle in his eyes. You will be allowed only one wife. At the entrance to the farthest hut, the only man in the kraal sat on a low carved stool. He had kept completely aloof from the screeching excitement, and now Hendrik crossed to him. He was much younger than Hendrik, with paler, almost honey-coloured skin. However, his muscle had been forged and tempered by hard physical labour, and there was a confidence about him, that of a man who has striven and succeeded. He had also an air of grace, and fine intelligent features with an elotic cast like those of a young pharaoh. Surprisingly, he held a thick, battered book in his lap, a copy of Macaulay's History of England. He greeted Hendrik with calm reserve, but their mutual affection was apparent to the white boy watching them. This is my clever young brother, same father but different mothers. He speaks Afrikaans and much better English than even I do, and he reads books. His English name is Moses. I see you, Moses. Manny felt awkward under the penetrating scrutiny of those dark eyes. I see you, little white boy. Do not call me boy, Manny said hotly. I am not a boy. The men exchanged glances and smiled. Moses is a boss boy on the Harney Diamond Mine, Hendrik explained in a placatory fashion. But the taller bamboo shook his head and replied in the vernacular. No longer, big brother. I was sacked over a month ago. So I sit here in the sun, drinking beer and reading and thinking, performing all those onerous tasks which are a man's duty. They laughed together. And Moses clapped his hands and called to the women imperiously. Bring beer! Do you not see how my brother thirsts? For Hendrik, it was good to divest himself of his Western European clothing and dress again in the comfortable loincloth, to let himself drift back into the pace of village life. It was good to savour the tart, effervescent sorghum beer, thick as gruel and cool in the clay pots, and to talk quietly of cattle and game of crops and rain, of acquaintances and friends and relatives, of deaths and births and matings. It was a long, leisurely time before they came circumspectly to the pressing issue which had to be discussed. Yes, Moses nodded, the police were here. Two dogs of the white men in Windhoek who should be ashamed to have betrayed their own tribe. They were not dressed in uniform, but still they had the stink of police upon them. They stayed many days, asking questions about a man called Svart Hendrik, smiling and friendly at first, and then angry and threatening. They beat a few of your women, your mother. He saw Hendrik stiffen 
and his jaw clench and went on quickly. She is old but tough. She has been beaten before. Our father was a strict man. Despite the blows, she did not know Svort Hendrik. Nobody knew Svort Hendrik. And the police dogs went away. They will return, said Hendrik, and his half-brother nodded. Yes, the white men never forget. Five years, ten years. They hanged a man in Pretoria for killing a man twenty-five years before. They will return. They drank in turn from the pot of beer, sipping with relish and then passing the black pot from hand to hand. So there was talk of a great robbery of diamonds on the road from the Harney, and they mentioned the name of the white devil with whom you have always ridden and fought, with whom you went out on the big green to catch fish. They say that you were with him at the taking of the diamonds, and that they will hang you on a rope when they find you. Hendrik chuckled and counterattacked. I also have heard stories of a fellow who is neither unknown nor unrelated to me. I have heard he is well versed in the disposal of stolen diamonds, that all the stones taken from the Harney mine pass through his hands. Now who could have told you such vile lies? Moses smiled faintly, and Hendrik gestured to Kleinboy. He brought a rawhide bag from its hiding place and placed it in front of his father. Hendrik opened the flap and one at a time lifted out the small packages of brown cartridge paper and laid them on the hard bare earth of the yard. Fourteen in a row. His brother took up the first package and with his sheath knife split the wax seal. This is the mark of the Harney mine he remarked, and carefully unfolded the paper. His expression did not change as he examined the contents. He placed the package aside and opened the next. He did not speak until he had opened all fourteen and studied them. Then he said softly, Death. There is death here. A hundred deaths, a thousand deaths. Can you sell them for us? Hendrik asked, and Moses shook his head. I have never seen such stones, so many together. To try to sell these all at once would bring disaster and death upon us all. I must think upon this. But in the meantime, we dare not keep these deadly stones in the kraal. The next morning, in the dawn, the three of them, Hendrik and Moses and Kleinboy, left the village together and climbed to the crest of the ridge where they found the leadwood tree that Hendrik remembered from the days when he roamed here as a naked herd boy. There was a hollow in the trunk, thirty feet above the ground, which had been the nesting hole of a pair of eagle owls. While the others stood guard, Kleinboy climbed to the nesting hole, carrying the rawhide bag. It was many days more before Moses gave his carefully considered summation. My brother, you and I are no longer of this life or this place. Already I have seen the first restlessness in you. I have seen you look out to the horizon with the expression of a man who longs to breast them. This life, so sweet at first, palls swiftly. The taste of beer goes flat on the tongue, and a man thinks of the brave things he has done and the braver things which wait for him still somewhere out there. Hendrik smiled. You are a man of many skills, my brother, even that of looking into a man's head and reading his secret thoughts. We cannot stay here, said Moses. The death stones are too dangerous to keep here, too dangerous to sell. 
Hendrik nodded. I am listening, he said. There are things which I have to do, said Moses, things which I believe are in my destiny, and of which I have never spoken, not even to you. Speak of them now, said Hendrik. I speak of the art which the white men call politics, and from which we, as black men, are excluded, said Moses. Hendrik made a dismissive, scornful gesture. You read too many books, he said. There is no profit or reward in that business. Leave it to the white men. You are wrong, my brother, said Moses. In that art lie treasures which make your little white stone seem paltry. No, do not scoff. Hendrik opened his mouth and then closed it slowly. He had not truly thought about this before, but the young man facing him had a powerful presence, a quivering intensity which stirred and excited him, although he did not fully understand the implication of his words. My brother, I have decided, said Moses. We will leave here. It is too small for us. Hendrik nodded. The thought did not disturb him, he had been a nomad all his life, and he was ready to move on again. Not only this crawl, my brother. We will leave this land, said Moses. Leave this land? Hendrik started up and then sank back on his stool. We have to do this. This land is too small for us and the stones, said Moses. Where will we go? asked Hendrik. His brother held up his hand. We will discuss that soon, but first you must rid us of this white child you have brought amongst us. He is even more dangerous than the stones. He will bring the white police down upon us even more swiftly. When you have done that, my brother, we will be ready to go on to do what we have to do. Swart Hendrik was a man of great strength, both physical and mental. He feared very little, would attempt anything and suffer much for what he wanted. But always he had followed someone else. Always there had been a man even fiercer and more fearless than he to lead him. We will do as you say, my brother, he agreed. And he knew instinctively that he had found someone to replace the man he had left to die upon a rock in the desert. I will wait here until the sun rises tomorrow, Svort Hendrik told the white boy. If you do not return by then, I will know you are safe. Will I see you again, Henny? Manny asked wistfully and Hendrik hesitated on the brink of empty promise. I think that our feet will be on different paths from now on, Manny. He reached out and placed a hand on Manfred's shoulder. But I shall think of you often, and who knows, one day the paths may come together again. He squeezed the boy's shoulder, and he noticed that it was sheathed in muscle, like that of a man full-grown. Go in peace, and be a man like your father was. He pushed Manfred away lightly, but the white boy lingered. Hendrik, he whispered, there are many things I want to say to you, but I do not have the words. Go, Hendrik said. We both know it does not have to be spoken of. Go, Manny. Manfred picked up his pack and blanket roll and stepped out of the undergrowth onto the dusty, rutted road. He started down towards the village, towards the spire of the church, which he recognised somehow as a symbol of a new existence that at once both beckoned and repelled him. 
At the bend in the road, he looked back. There was no sign of the big Avambo, and he turned and trudged down the main street towards the church at the far end. Without conscious decision, he turned from the main street down a side opening, and approached the pastory along the sanitary lane, as he had done on the last visit with his father. The narrow lane was hedged with fleshy Moroto plants, and he whiffed the sanitary buckets behind the little sliding doors of the outhouses that backed onto the lane. He hesitated at the back gate of the pastory, and then lifted the latch. And started at a snail's pace up the long pathway. Halfway along the path, he was stopped by a bellow, and he stared about him apprehensively. There was another roar, and a loud voice lifted in exhortation or acrimonious argument. It came from a ramshackle building at the bottom of the yard, a large woodshed, perhaps. Manfred. Sidled down towards the shed and peered around the jam of the door. The interior was dark, but as his eyes adjusted, Manfred saw that it was a tool room, with an anvil and forge at one end, and tools hanging on the walls. The earthen floor was bare, and in the center of it knelt Trump Beerman, the trumpet of God. He was wearing dark suit trousers and a white shirt with the white tie of his office. His suit jacket hung on a pair of blacksmith's tongs above the anvil. Trump Beerman's bushy beard was pointed to the roof, and his eyes were closed. His arms lifted in an attitude of surrender or supplication, but his tone was far from submissive. O、oh、Lord God of Israel. I call upon you most urgently to give answer to your servants' prayers for guidance in this matter. How can I perform your will if I do not know what it is? I am only a humble instrument. I dare not take this decision alone. Look down, O Lord God. Have pity on my ignorance and stupidity, and make known your intentions. Trump broke off suddenly and opened his eyes. The great shaggy leonine head turned, and the eyes, like those of an Old Testament prophet, burned into Manfred's soul. Hastily, Manfred snatched the shapeless, sweat-stained hat from his head and held it with both hands to his chest. "I have come back, Oom," he said, "just like you said I must." Trump stared at him ferociously. He saw a sturdy lad. Broad-shouldered and with powerful, shapely limbs, a head of dusty golden curls and contrasting eyebrows, black as coal dust, over strange topaz-coloured eyes. He tried to see beyond the pale surface of those eyes, and was aware of an aura of determination and lucid intelligence that surrounded the youth. Come here, he ordered, and Manfred dropped his pack and went to him. Trump seized him by the hand and dragged him down. Kneel, Yong. Get down on your knees and give thanks to your Maker. Praise the Lord God of your fathers that He has heard my supplications on your behalf. Dutifully, Manfred closed his eyes and clasped his hand. O、oh、Lord, forgive your servant's importunity in bringing to your notice such other trivial matters. When in fact you were occupied with more dire affairs, we thank you for delivering into our care this young person, whom we shall temper and hone into a sword, a mighty blade that shall strike down the Philistine, a weapon that shall be wielded to your glory, in the just and righteous cause of your chosen people, the Afrikaner Volk. He prodded Manfred with a forefinger like a pruning shear. Amen. Manfred gasped at the pain. We will glorify and praise you all the days of our life, O Lord, and we beg of you to bestow upon this chosen son of our people the fortitude and the determination. The prayer. 
punctuated by Manfred's fervent amens, lasted until Manfred's knees ached and he was dizzy with fatigue and hunger. Then suddenly Tromp hauled him to his feet and marched him up the path to the kitchen door. Mevro, the trumpet of God sounded. Where are you, woman? Trudy Beerman rushed breathlessly into the kitchen at the summons and then stopped aghast, staring at the boy in ragged, filthy clothing. My kitchen, she wailed. My beautiful, clean kitchen. I have just waxed the floor. The Lord God has sent this young to us, Tromp intoned. We will take him into our home. He will eat at our table. He will be as one of our own. But he is filthy as a kaffir. Then wash him, woman. Wash him. At that moment, a girl slipped timidly through the doorway behind the matronly figure of Trudy Beerman, and then stiffened like a frightened fawn as she saw Manfred. Manfred barely recognised Sarah. She had filled out firm, well-scrubbed flesh, covered her elbows, which had so recently been bony lumps on stick-like arms. Her once pale cheeks were apple pink. The eyes that had been lacklustre were clear and bright. Her blonde hair, brushed until it shone, was plaited into twin pigtails and pinned on top of her head and she wore long, modest, but spotless skirts to her ankles. She let out a cry and rushed at Manfred with arms outstretched, but Trudy Beerman seized her from behind and shook her soundly. You lazy, wicked girl! I left you to finish your sums! Back you go this instant! She pushed her roughly from the room and turned back to Manfred, her arms folded and her mouth pursed. You are disgusting, she told him. Your hair is long as a girl's. These clothes... Her expression hardened even more fearsomely. And we are Christian folk in this house. We'll have none of your father's godless wild ways. Do you understand? I'm hungry, Aunt Trudy. You'll eat when everybody else eats, and not before you are clean. She looked at her husband. Men here, will you show the boy how to build a fire in the hot water geyser? She stood in the doorway of the tiny bathroom and remorselessly supervised his ablutions, brushing aside all his attempts at modesty and his protest at the temperature of the water. And when he faltered, taking the bar of blue mottled soap herself, and scrubbing his most tender and intimate creases and folds. Then, with only a skimpy towel about his waist, she led him by the ear down the back steps and sat him on a fruit box. She armed herself with a pair of sheep shears, and Manfred's blonde hair fell about his shoulders like wheat before the scythe. When he ran his hand over his scalp, it was stubbly and bristly, and the back of his neck and the skin behind his ears felt cool and draughty. Trudy Beerman gathered up his discarded clothing with a pantomime of distaste and opened the furnace of the geyser. Manfred was only just in time to rescue his jacket, and when she saw his expression as he backed away from her, holding the garment behind his back and surreptitiously fingering the small lumps in the lining, she shrugged. Very well, perhaps with a wash and a few patches. In the meantime... I'll find you some of the Domini's old things. Trudy Behrman took Manfred's appetite as a personal challenge to her kitchen and her culinary skills. She kept heaping his plate even before he had finished, standing over him with a ladle in one hand and the handle of the stew pot in the other. When at last he fell back, satiated, she went to fetch the milk tart from the pantry with a victorious gleam in her eye. As strangers in the family, Manfred and Sarah were allocated the lowliest seats in the centre of the table, the two plump, pudding-faced, blonde beermen daughters sitting above them. 
Sarah picked at her food so lightly that she earned Trudy Behrman's ire. I didn't cook good food for you to fiddle with, young lady. You'll sit here as long as it takes you to clean your plate, spinach and all, even if that takes all night. And Sarah chewed mechanically, never taking her eyes from Manfred's face. It was the first time that Manfred had paid for a meal with two graces, before and after, and each of them seemed interminable. He was nodding and swaying in his chair when Tromp Beerman startled him fully awake with an Amen, like a salvo of artillery. The pastory was already groaning at the seams with Sarah and the Beerman offspring. There was no place for Manfred, so he was allocated a corner of the tool shed at the bottom of the yard. Aunt Trudy had turned a packing case on end to act as a cupboard for his few cast-off items of clothing, and there was an iron bed with a hard, lumpy coir mattress and a faded old curtain hung on a string to screen his sleeping corner. Don't waste the candle, Aunt Trudy cautioned him from the doorway of the tool shed. You will only get a new one on the first day of each month. We are thrifty folk here. None of your father's extravagances, thank you. Manfred pulled the thin grey blanket over his head to protect his naked scalp from the chill. It was the first time in his life that he had a bed and a room of his own, and he revelled in the sensation, sniffing the aroma of axle grease and paraffin and the dead coals in the forge as he fell asleep. He woke to a light touch on his cheek and cried out. Confused images rushed out of the darkness to terrify him. He had dreamed of his father's hand, reeking of gangrene, that had reached across from the far side of the grave, and he struggled up from under the blanket. Maney, Maney, it's me! Sarah's voice was as terrified as his own cry had been. She was silhouetted by the moonlight through the single uncurtained window, thin and shivering in a white nightdress, her hair brushed out and hanging to her shoulders in a silvery cloud. What are you doing here? he mumbled. You mustn't come here. You must go. If they find you here, they will... He broke off. He was not sure what the consequences would be. But he knew instinctively that they would be severe. This strange but pleasant new sense of security and belonging would be shattered. I've been so unhappy. He could tell by her voice that she was crying. Ever since you went away... The girls are so cruel. They call me Wilgard. Trash. They tease me because I can't read and do sums the way they can, and because I speak funny. I've cried every night since you went away. Manfred's heart went out to her, and despite his nervousness at being discovered, he reached out for her and drew her down onto the bed. I'm here now. I'll look after you, Sari he whispered. I won't let them tease you any more. She sobbed against his neck, and he told her sternly, I don't want any more crying, sorry. You aren't a baby any more. You must be brave. I was crying because I was happy, she sniffed. No more crying, not even when you are happy, he ordered. Do you understand? And she nodded furiously and made a little choking sound as she brought her tears under control. "'I've thought about you every day,' she whispered. "'I prayed to God to bring you back like you promised. "'Can I get into bed with you, Manny? I'm cold.' "'No,' he said firmly. "'You must go back before they catch you here.' "'Just for a moment,' she pleaded. "'And before he could protest... She had wriggled around, lifted the blanket, and slipped under the corner. She wrapped herself around him. The night dress was thin and worn, her body cold and shivery, and he could not bring himself to chase her out. Five minutes, he muttered. Then you have to go. Swiftly the heat flowed back into her small body, and her hair was soft against his face and smelt good like the fur of an unweaned kitten, milky and warm. 
She made him feel old and important, and he stroked her hair with a paternal proprietary feeling. Do you think God answers our prayers? Sarah asked softly. I prayed the hardest I know how, and here you are, just like I asked. She was silent a moment. But it took a long time and a lot of prayers. I don't know about prayers, he admitted. My pa never prayed much. He never taught me how. Well, you better get used to it now, she warned him. In this house, everybody prays all the time. When she at last crept out of the tool shed back to the big house, she left a warm patch on the mattress and a warmer place in his heart. It was still dark when Manfred was roused by a blast from the trumpet of God in person. Ten seconds, and then you get a bucket of cold water, Yong. And Uncle Trump led him, shivering and covered in goosebumps, to the trough beside the stables. Cold water is the best cure for the sins of the young flesh, Yong. Uncle Trump told him with relish. You will muck out the stables and carry the pony before breakfast. Do you hear? The day was a dizzying succession of labour and prayer, the household chores sandwiched between long sessions of schoolwork and even longer sessions on their knees, while either Uncle Trump or Aunt Trudy exhorted God to step up their performance or visit them with all kinds of retribution. Yet, by the end of the first week, Manfred had subtly but permanently rearranged the pecking order amongst the younger members of the household. He had quelled the Beermans girl's first furtive but concerted attempts at mockery with a steady implacable stare from his yellow eyes, and they retreated in twittering consternation. Over the school books, it was different. His cousins were all dedicated scholars, with the benefit of a lifetime of enforced study. As Manfred grimly applied himself to the tome on German grammar and Milk's mathematics for secondary schools, their smug, self-satisfied smiles at his floundering replies to Aunt Trudy's catechism were all the incentive he needed. I'll show them, he promised himself, and he was so committed to the task of catching and overhauling his cousins that it was days before he became aware of how the Beerman girls were victimising little Sarah. Their cruelty was refined and secretive. A jibe, a name, a mocking face. Calculated exclusion from their games and laughter. Sabotage of her domestic chores. A soot stain on garments Sarah had just ironed. Rumpled linen on a bed she had just made. Grease marks on dishes she had washed. And vicious grins when Sarah was chastised for laziness and negligence by Aunt Trudy, who was only too pleased to perform this godly duty with the back of a hairbrush. Manfred caught each of the Beerman girls alone, held them by the pigtails, and looked into their eyes from a range of a few inches, while he spoke in a soft, measured voice that hissed with passion and ended, And don't run and tell tales to your mother either. Their deliberate cruelty ended with dramatic suddenness and under Manfred's protection, Sarah was left severely alone. At the end of that first week, after the fifth church service of a long, tedious Sunday, one of the cousins appeared in the doorway of the tool shed where Manfred was stretched on his bed with his German grammar. My pa wants to see you in his study and the messenger wrung one hand in a parody of looming disaster. Manfred soused his short-cropped hair under the tap and tried to brush it flat in the splinter of mirror wedged above his bed. It immediately sprang up again in damp spikes, and he gave up the effort 
and hurried to answer the summons. He had never been allowed into the front rooms of the pastory. They were sacrosanct, and of these the Domini's study was the Holy of Holies. He knew from warnings, repeated by his cousins with morbid relish, that a summons to this room was always associated with punishment and pain. He trembled on the threshold, knowing that Sarah's nightly visits to the tool shed had been discovered. And he started wildly at the bellow that answered his timid knock, then pushed the door open slowly and stepped inside. Uncle Trump stood behind the sombre stinkwood desk, leaning on clenched fists that were placed in the centre of the blotter. Come in, Yong. Shut the door. Don't just stand there, he roared and dropped heavily into his chair. Manfred stood before him, trying to form the words of repentance and atonement, but before he could utter them, Uncle Trump spoke again. Well, Yong, I have had reports of you from your aunt. His tone was at odds with his ferocious expression. She tells me that your education has been sadly neglected, but that you are willing and seem to be applying yourself. Manfred sagged with relief so intense that he had difficulty following the long exhortation that followed. We are the underdogs, Young. We are the victims of oppression and Milnerism. Manfred knew about Lord Milner from his father, the notorious English governor and opponent of Africanadom, under whose decree all children who spoke the Afrikaans' language in school were forced to wear a dunce's cap with the legend, I am a donkey, I spoke Dutch, inscribed upon it. There is only one way that we can overcome our enemies, Yong. We have to become cleverer and stronger and more ruthless than they are. The trumpet of God became so absorbed by his own words that he lifted his gaze to the elaborate patterns of the fancy plastered ceiling, and his eyes glazed over with a mixture of religious and political fanaticism, leaving Manfred free to glance around him furtively at the over-furnished room. Bookshelves covered three walls, all of them stacked with religious and serious tomes. John Calvin and the authors of the Presbyterian form of church government predominated, though there were works of history and philosophy, law and biography, dictionaries and encyclopedia, and shelves of hymns and collected sermons in high Dutch, German and English. The fourth wall, directly behind Uncle Trump's desk, carried a gallery of photographs. Stern ancestors in Sunday finery in the top row, and then, below them, devout congregations or learned members of Synod, all featuring amongst them the unmistakable likeness of Trump Biermann, a gradually maturing and ageing succession of Trumps, from clean-shaven and bright-eyed youth to bearded leonine maturity in the front row. Then, quite incongruously and startlingly, a framed and yellowing photograph, the largest of them all and situated in the most prominent position, depicting a young man stripped to the waist, wearing full-length tights, and about his middle a magnificent belt, gleaming with engraved silver buckles and medallions. The man in the photograph was Trump Biermann, aged no more than twenty-five, clean-shaven, his hair parted in the middle and plastered flat with brilliantine, his powerful body marvellously muscled, his clenched fists held before him, crouching in the classic stance of the pugilist. A small table in front of him held a treasure of glittering cups and sporting trophies. The young man smiled out of the photograph, strikingly handsome, and in Manfred's eyes, impossibly dashing and romantic. "'You are a boxer!' he blurted out, unable to contain his wonder and admiration. 
and the trumpet of God was cut off in mid-blast. The great shaggy head lowered, the eyes blinking as they readjusted to reality, and then swivelling to follow Manfred's gaze. "'Not just a boxer,' said Uncle Trump, "'but a champion, light heavyweight champion of the Union of South Africa.' He looked back and saw the expression on Manfred's face, and his own expression warmed and melted with remembrance and gratification. "'Did you win all those cups and that belt?' "'I surely did, Yong. "'I smote the Philistines hip and thigh. "'I struck them down in their multitudes.' "'Did you only fight Philistines, Uncle Trump?' "'They were all Philistines, Yong. "'As soon as they stepped into the ring with me, "'they became Philistines, "'and I fell upon them without mercy, "'like the hammer and the sword of the Almighty.' Trump Beerman lifted his clenched fist in front of him and shot out a swift tattoo of punches, firing them across the desk, stopping each blow only inches from Manfred's nose. I made my living with these fists, Young. All comers are ten pounds a time. I fought Mike Williams and put him down in the sixth, the great Mike Williams himself. He grunted as he weaved and boxed in his chair. Ha! Ha! Left! Right! Left! I even thrashed the Black Jephthah, and I took the title from Jack Lalore in 1916. I can still hear the cheers now as Lalore hit the canvas. Sweet, my young, so very sweet. He broke off and replaced his hands in his lap, his expression becoming dignified and stern once again. Then your Aunt Trudy and the Lord God of Israel called me from the ring to more important work. And the gleam of battle lust faded regretfully from Uncle Trump's eyes. Boxing and being champion, that would be the most important thing for me, Manfred breathed, and Trump's gaze focused thoughtfully upon him. He looked him over carefully from the top of his cropped head, to his large but well-proportioned feet in battered Valkskorn. "'You want to learn to fight?' He dropped his voice and glanced at the door, a conspiratorial gesture. Manfred could not answer. His throat was closed with excitement, but he nodded vigorously, and Uncle Trump went on in his normal piercing tones. "'Your Aunt Trudy doesn't approve of brawling. Quite right, too.' Fisticuffs are for hooligans. Put the thought from your mind, Yong. Think on higher planes. He shook his head so vigorously that his beard was disarranged. It took that effort to dislodge the notion from his own head, and he combed his beard with his fingers as he went on. To return to what I was saying, your aunt and I think it best that you drop the name Delaray for the time being. You shall adopt the name Beerman until the notoriety of your father's trial fades. There has already been too much mention of that name in the newspapers, those organs of Lucifer. Your aunt is quite right in not allowing them into this house. There will be a great hoo-ha once the trial of your father begins in Windhoek next month. It could bring shame and disgrace on you and this family. My father's trial? Manfred stared at him without comprehension. But my father is dead. Dead? Is that what you thought? Trump stood up and came around the desk. Forgive me, Young. He placed both his huge hands on Manfred's shoulders. I have caused you unnecessary suffering by not speaking of this earlier. Your father is not dead. He has been captured by the police, and he will stand trial for his life at the Supreme Court in Windhoek on the 20th of next month. He steadied Manfred as the boy reeled at the impact of the words, and then went on with a gentle rumble. Now you understand why we want you to change your name, Yong. Sarah had hurried through her ironing and sneaked out of the house. 
She was perched now on top of the wood pile, with her knees drawn up under her chin, hugging her legs with both arms as she watched Manfred at work. She loved to watch him with the axe. It was a long, two-handed axe with a red-painted head and a bright edge to the blade. Manny sharpened it on the whetstone until he could shave the fine gold hair off the back of his hand with it. He had taken off his shirt and given it to her to hold. His chest and back were all shiny with sweat. She liked the way he smelled when he sweated, like newly baked bread, or like a sun-warm fig just picked from the tree. Manfred laid another log in the cradle and stood back. He spat on the palms of his hands. He always did that, and she involuntarily worked up a ball of spit in her own mouth in sympathy. Then he hefted the long axe, and she tensed herself. Five times table, he ordered, and swung the axe in a long, looping blow. It hummed faintly over his head as he brought it down. The bright blade buried itself in the log with a clunk, and at the same instant Manny gave a sharp, explosive grunt of effort. Five ones are five, she recited in time to the swinging axe. Five twos are ten, Manny grunted, and a white wedge of wood flew as high as his head. Five threes are fifteen. The axe head spun a bright circle in the yellow light of the lowering sun, and Sarah chanted shrilly as the wood chips pelted down like hail. The log dropped from the cradle in two pieces, just as Sarah cried, Five tens are fifty! Manny stepped back and leaned on the axe handle and grinned at her. Very good, Sarah. Not a single mistake. She preened with pleasure, and then stared over his shoulder, her expression suddenly stricken and guilty. She leapt down from the woodpile, and in a swirl of skirts, scampered back up the path to the house. Manny turned quickly. Uncle Trump was leaning against the corner of the tool shed, watching him. I'm sorry, Uncle Trump. He ducked his head. I know she shouldn't be here, but I just can't send her away. Uncle Trump pushed himself away from the wall and came slowly to where Manfred stood. He moved like a great bear with long arms dangling. And he circled Manfred slowly, examining him with a small, distracted frown creasing his forehead. Manfred squirmed self-consciously and Uncle Trump prodded his gut with a large, painful finger. How old are you, young? Manfred told him, and Uncle Trump nodded. Three years to full growth. You'll class light heavy, I'd say, unless you make a spurt at the end and go full heavyweight. Manfred felt his skin prickle at the unfamiliar but somehow tremendously exciting terms and Uncle Trump left him and went to the woodpile. Deliberately, he stripped off the dark jacket of his suit and folded it neatly. He laid it on the woodpile, and then unknotted his white minister's tie and laid that meticulously on top of his jacket. He came back to Manfred, rolling up the sleeves of his white shirt. So you want to be a boxer? he asked, and Manfred nodded, unable to speak. Put the axe away. Manfred buried the blade in the chopping stump and faced his uncle again. Uncle Trump held up his open right hand, palm towards Manfred. Hit it, he said. Manfred clenched his fist and made a tentative round arm swing. You aren't knitting socks, young. You aren't kneading bread. What are you, a man or a kitchen maid? Hit it, man! Hit it! That's better. Don't swing it around the back of your head. Shoot it out. Harder! Harder! That's more like it. Now you're left. That's it. Left, right, left. 
Uncle Trump was holding up both hands now, swaying and dancing in front of him, and Manfred followed him eagerly, socking alternate fists into the big open palms. All right. Trump dropped his hands. Now hit me. Hit me in the face. Go on, hard as you can. Right on the button. Let's see you knock me on my back. Manfred dropped his hands and stepped back. I can't do that, Uncle Trump, he protested. Can't do what, young? What can't you do? I couldn't hit you. It wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be respectful. So we are talking respect now, not boxing. We are talking powder puffs and ladies' gloves, are we? Uncle Trump roared. I thought you wanted to fight. I thought you wanted to be a man. And now I find a snot-nosed whining baby. He changed his voice to a cracked falsetto. It wouldn't be right, Uncle Trump. It wouldn't be respectful. He mimicked. Suddenly, his right hand shot out, and the open palm cracked against Manfred's cheek, a stinging slap that left the scarlet imprint of fingers on his skin. You're not respectful, young. You're yellow. That's what you are, a yellow-bellied, whimpering little boy. You're not a man. You'll never be a fighter. The other huge paw blurred with speed, coming so fast and unexpectedly that Manfred barely saw it. The pain of the blow filled his eyes with tears. We'll have to find a skirt for you, girlie, a yellow skirt. Uncle Trump was watching him carefully, watching his eyes, praying silently for it to happen as he poured withering contempt. On the sturdy youth who retreated, bewildered and uncertain, he followed and struck again, cutting Manfred's lower lip, splitting the soft skin against his teeth, leaving a smear of blood down his chin. Come on, he exhorted silently behind the jeering flood of insults. Come on, please, come on. Then, with a great explosion of joy that filled his chest to bursting, he saw it happen. Manfred dropped his chin, and his eyes changed. Suddenly, they glowed with a cold yellow light, implacable as the stare of a lion in the moment before it launches its charge. And the youth came at him. Though he had been waiting for it, expecting it, praying for it, still the speed and savagery of the attack caught Uncle Trump off balance. Only the old fighter's instinct saved him. And he deflected that first murderous assault, sensing the power in the fists that grazed his temple and ruffled his beard as they passed. And for the first few desperate seconds, there was no time for thought. All his wits and attention were needed to stay on his feet and keep the cold, ferocious animal he had created at bay. Then experience and ringcraft, long forgotten, reasserted themselves. And he ducked and dodged and danced easily just beyond the boy's reach, deflecting the wild punches, watching objectively, as though he sat in a ringside seat, assessing with rising delight the way in which the untutored youth used either fist with equal power and dexterity. A natural two-handed puncher, he doesn't favour his right, and he gets his shoulders behind every punch without being taught how. He exulted. Then he looked again at the eyes, and felt a chill of awe at what he had loosed upon the world. He's a killer. He recognised it. He has the instinct of a leopard who kills for the taste of blood and the simple joy of it. He no longer sees me; he sees only the prey before him. That knowledge had distracted him. He caught a right hand on his upper arm. And it jarred the teeth in his jaws and the bones of his ankles. He knew it would bruise him from the shoulder to the elbow, and his breath burned in his throat. His legs were turning to lead. He could feel his heart drumming against his ribs. Twenty-two years since he had been in the ring, twenty-two years of Trudy's cooking, and his most vigorous exercise undertaken either at his desk or in the pulpit. While the youth before him was like a machine, boring in remorselessly, 
both fists swinging, those yellow eyes fixed upon him in a murderous, myopic stare. Uncle Trump gathered himself, waited for the opening as Manfred swung right-handed, and then he counterpunched with his left, always his best, the same blow that had dropped Black Jephthah in the third, and it went in with that beautiful little click of bone against bone. Manfred dropped to his knees, stunned, the killing yellow light fading from his eyes to be replaced by a dull, bemused look, as though awakening from a trance. That's it, Yong! The trumpet of God's fine note was reduced to a breathy gasp. Down on your knees and give thanks to your maker! Uncle Trump lowered his bulk beside Manfred and placed a thick arm around his shoulders. He raised his face and his unsteady voice to heaven. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the strong body with which you have endowed your young servant. We give you thanks also for his natural left, while realizing that it will need a lot of hard work. And we humbly beseech you to look favorably upon our efforts to instill in him even the rudiments of footwork. His right hand is a blessing directly from you, for which we will always be eternally grateful, though he will learn not to telegraph it five days in advance of the punch. Manfred was still shaking his head and rubbing his jaw, but he responded to the probing thumb in the ribs with a fervent, Amen. We will begin roadwork immediately, O Lord, while we set up a ring in the toolshed in which to learn the ropes. And we humbly beseech your blessing on our enterprise and your cooperation in keeping it from coming to the notice of your servant's partner in holy matrimony, Trudy Beerman. Most afternoons, under the pre pretext of visiting one of his parishioners, Uncle Trump would put the pony in the trap and drive out of the front gate with a flourish, waving to his wife on the front stoop. Manfred would be waiting at the clump of camel-thorn trees beside the main Windhoek Road, already barefoot and stripped to khaki shorts. And he would trot out and fall in beside the trap as Uncle Trump shook the fat pony into a canter. Five miles today, Yong, down to the river bridge and back, and we'll do it a bit faster than yesterday. The gloves that Uncle Trump had smuggled down from the trunk in the loft were cracked with age, but they patched them with wood glue, and the first time he laced them onto Manfred's hands, he watched while the lad lifted them to his nose and sniffed them. The smell of leather and sweat and blood, Yong. Fill your nostrils with it. You'll live with it from now on. Manfred punched the tattered old gloves together, and for a moment that flat yellow light glowed in his eyes again. Then he grinned. They feel good, he said. Nothing feels better. Uncle Trump agreed, and led him to the heavy canvas kit bag filled with river sand that hung from the rafters in the corner of the tool shed. To begin with, I want to see that left hand do some work. It's like a wild horse. We have to break it and train it, teach it not to waste strength and effort. It has to learn to do our bidding, not flap around in the air. They built the ring together, quarter full size for the tool shed would take no more, and they sank the corner poles deep in the earthen floor and cemented them in. Then they stretched a sheet of canvas over the floor. The canvas and the cement had been commandeered from one of Uncle Trump's wealthy parishioners. For the glory of God and the bulk, an appeal that could not be lightly dismissed. Sarah sworn to secrecy by the most solemn and dreadful oath that Manfred and Uncle Trump could concoct between them, was allowed to watch the ring work, even though she was a thoroughly partisan audience and cheered shrilly and shamelessly for the younger participant. After two of these sessions, which left Uncle Trump unmarked but blowing like a steam engine, 
He shook his head ruefully. It's no use, Yong. Either we have to find you another sparring partner, or I'll have to start training again myself. Thereafter, the pony was left, tethered in the camel thorn clump, and Uncle Trump grunted and gasped beside Manfred on the long runs, while the sweat fell from his beard like the first rains of summer. However, his protuberant gut shriveled miraculously, and soon, from under the layers of soft fat that covered his shoulders and chest, the outline of hard muscle reappeared. Gradually, they stepped up the rounds from two to four minutes, with Sarah, elected official timekeeper, measuring each round with Uncle Trump's cheap silver pocket watch, which made up for its dubious accuracy by its size. It was almost a month before Uncle Trump could say to himself, though he would never have dreamed of saying it to Manfred, "He is starting to look like a boxer now." Instead, he said, "Now I want speed. I want you to be as fast as a mamba, brave as a rattle." The mamba was the most dreaded of all Africa's serpents. It could grow as thick as a man's wrist and reach twenty feet in length. Its venom could inflict death on a fully grown man in four minutes—an excruciating death. The mamba was so swift that it could overhaul a galloping horse. And the strike was so swift as to cheat the eye. Fast as a mamba, brave as a ratel, Uncle Trump repeated, as he would a hundred, a thousand times in the years ahead. The ratel was the African honey badger, a small animal with a loose but thick, tough skin, that could defy the bite of a mastiff or the fangs of a leopard. A massive, flattened skull. From which the heaviest club bounced harmlessly, and the heart of a lion, the courage of a giant. Normally mild and forbearing, it would fearlessly attack the largest adversary the instant that it was provoked. Legend had it that the ratel possessed an instinct for the groin, and that it would rush in and rip the testicles out of any male animal, man or bull, buffalo, lion or elephant who threatened it. I've got something to show you, Yong. Uncle Trump led Manfred to the big wooden chest against the back wall of the tool shed, and opened the lid. It's for you. I ordered it by mail order from Cape Town. It arrived on the train yesterday. He placed the tangle of leather and rubber in Manfred's arms. What is it? Uncle Trump, come! I'll show you. Within minutes, Uncle Trump had rigged the complicated contraption. Well, what do you think, Yong? He stood back, beaming hugely through his beard. It's the best present anyone has ever given me, Uncle Trump. But what is it? You call yourself a boxer. And you don't know a speed bag when you see one. A speed bag? It must have cost a lot of money. It did, Yong, but don't tell your aunt Trudy. What do we do with it? This is what we do with it," cried Uncle Trump, and he started the bag rattling against the frame in a rapid staccato rhythm, using both fists, taking the ball on the bounce. Keeping it going unerringly until at last he stepped back, panting. Speed, young, fast as a mamba. Faced with Uncle Trump's generosity and enthusiasm, Manfred had to gather all his courage to speak the words that had been burning his tongue all these weeks. He waited until the last possible moment of the last possible day, before blurting out. I have to go away, Uncle Trump. And he watched in agony the disappointment and disbelief flood over the craggy bearded face that he had come so swiftly and naturally to love. Go away, 
You want to leave my house? Uncle Trump stopped short in the dust of the Vinthoek Road and wiped the sweat from his face with the threadbare towel draped around his neck. Why, John? Why? My pa, Manfred answered. My pa's trial starts in three days' time. I have to be there, Uncle Trump. I have to go. But I will come back. I swear I will come back just as soon as I can. Uncle Trump turned from him and began to run again, pounding down the long, straight road, the dust puffing from under his bear-like feet at each pace, and Manfred sprinted up beside him. Neither of them spoke again until they reached the clump of trees where the pony trap was hitched. Oom Trump climbed up into the driver's seat and picked up the reins. He looked down at Manfred standing beside the front wheel. I wish, young, that I had a son of my own to show me such loyalty. He rumbled softly and shook the pony into a trot. The following evening, long after dinner and the evening prayers, Manfred lay on his bed, the candle on the shelf above his head carefully screened, so that not a glimmer could alert Aunt Trudy to his extravagance. He was reading Goethe, his father's favourite author. It wasn't easy. His German had improved vastly. On two days a week, Aunt Trudy insisted that no other language was spoken in the household and she initiated erudite discussion at the dinner table in which all members of the family were expected, nay, forced, to participate. Still, Goethe wasn't a rump, and Manfred was concentrating so fiercely on his convoluted use of verbs that he didn't know Uncle Trump was in the room until his shadow fell across the bed and the book was lifted from his hand. You will ruin your eyes, young. Manfred sat up quickly and swung his legs off the bed while Uncle Trump sank down beside him. For a few moments the old man leafed through the book. Then he spoke without looking up. Rautenbach is going into Windhoek tomorrow in his T-model Ford. He is taking in a hundred turkeys to market, but he will have room for you on the back. You'll have to put up with flying feathers and turkey shit, but it's cheaper than the train. Thank you, Uncle Trump, said Manfred. He went on. There is an old widow in town, devout and decent, also a very good cook. She'll take you in. I've written to her. Uncle Trump drew a sheet of his notepaper from his pocket and placed it in Manfred's lap. The single sheet was folded and sealed with a blob of red wax. A backcountry minister's stipend could not encompass the luxury of envelopes. Thank you, Uncle Trump. Manfred could think of nothing else to say. He wanted to fling his arms round that thick, bear-like neck and lay his cheek against the coarse, grey-shot beard. But he controlled himself. There may be other expenses, Uncle Trump gruffed. I don't know how you will get back here. Anyway, he groped in his pocket, seized Manfred's wrist with the other hand and pressed something into his open palm. Manfred looked down at the two bright half-crown coins in his hand and shook his head slowly. Uncle Trump, say nothing, young, especially not to your Aunt Trudy. Uncle Trump began to stand, but Manfred caught his sleeve. Uncle Trump, I can pay you back for this and all the other things. I know you will, Yong. You will pay me back a thousand times in pride and joy one day. No, no, not one day. Now. I can pay you back now. Manfred sprang eagerly from the bed and ran to the upended packing case, standing on four bricks, 
that was his wardrobe. He knelt and thrust his arm into the space below the box and brought out a yellow tobacco bag. He hurried back to where Uncle Trump sat on the iron bed, pulling open the drawstrings of the small pouch, his hands shaking with excitement and eagerness to please. Here, Uncle Trump, open your hand. Smiling indulgently, Uncle Trump held out his huge paw, the back of it covered with coarse black curls, the fingers thick as good farmer's sausages. What have you here, Yong? he demanded jovially. And then the smile froze, as Manfred spilled a cascade of glittering stones into his hand. Diamonds, Uncle Trump, Manfred whispered. Enough to make you a rich man. Enough to buy you anything you need. Where did you get these, Yong? Uncle Trump's voice was calm and dispassionate. How did you come by these? My pa, my father. He put them into the lining of my jacket. He said they were for me to pay for my education and my upbringing, to pay for all the things that he wanted to do for me, but had never been able. So, said Uncle Trump softly, it is all true then, all of what the newspapers say. It isn't just English lies. Your father is a brigand and a robber. The huge hand clenched into a fist over the glittering treasure. And you were with him, Yong. You must have been there when he did these terrible things that they accuse him of, that they will try and condemn him for. Were you with him, Yong? Answer me! His voice was rising like a storm wind, and now he let out a bellow. Did you commit this great evil with him, Yong? The other hand shot out and seized the front of Manfred's shirt. He pulled Manfred's face to within inches of his own jutting beard. Confess to me, Yong. Tell it all to me, every last scrap of evil. Were you with him when your father attacked this English woman and robbed her? No, no. Manfred shook his head wildly. It's not true. My father wouldn't do a thing like that. They were our diamonds. He explained it to me. He went to get back what was rightfully ours. Were you with him when he did this thing, Yong? Tell me the truth. Uncle Trump interrupted him with another roar. Tell me, were you with him? No, Uncle Trump. He went alone. And when he came back, he was hurt. His hand, his wrist. Thank you, Lord. Uncle Trump looked upwards with relief. Forgive him, for he knew not what he did, O Lord. He was led into sin by an evil man. My father isn't evil, Manfred protested. He was cheated out of what was truly his. Silence, Yong. Oom Trump rose to his full height, splendid and awesome as a biblical prophet. Your words are an offence in the sight of God. You will make retribution here and now. He dragged Manfred across the tool room and pushed him in front of the black iron anvil. Thou shalt not steal. That is the very word of God. He placed one of the diamonds in the centre of the anvil. These stones are the ill-begotten fruits of a terrible evil. He reached to the rack beside him and brought down a four-pound sledgehammer. They must be destroyed. He thrust the hammer into Manfred's hands. Pray for forgiveness, Yong. Beg the Lord for his charity and forgiveness. And strike! Manfred stood with the hammer in his hands, holding it at high port across his chest, staring at the diamond on the anvil. Strike, Yong! Break 
that cursed thing or be forever cursed by it, roared Uncle Trump. Strike in the name of God. Rid yourself of the guilt and the shame. Slowly, Manfred raised the hammer on high and then paused. He turned and looked at the fierce old man. Strike swiftly, roared Uncle Trump. Now! And Manfred swung. The same fluid, looping, overhead blow with which he chopped wood. And he grunted with effort as the head of the hammer rang on the anvil. Manfred lifted the hammer slowly. The diamond was crushed to white powder, finer than sugar. But still the vestiges of its fire and beauty remained as each minute crystal caught and magnified the candlelight. And when Uncle Trump brushed the diamond dust from the anvil top with his open hand, it fell in a luminous rainbow to the earthen floor. Uncle Trump laid another fiery stone upon the anvil, a fortune such as few men could amass in ten years of unremitting labour, and stood back. Strike! he cried, and the hammer hissed as it turned in the air and the anvil rang like a great gong. The precious dust was brushed aside, and another stone laid in its place. Strike! roared the trumpet of God, and Manfred worked with the hammer, grunting and sobbing in his throat with each fateful blow, until at last Uncle Trump cried, Praised be the name of the Lord! It is done! And he fell on his knees, dragging Manfred down with him, and side by side they knelt before the anvil as though it were an altar, and the white diamond dust coated their knees as they prayed. O oh Lord Jesus, look upon this act of penance with favour. Thou, who gave up thy life for our redemption, forgive thy young servant whose ignorance and childishness has led him into grievous sin. It was after midnight, and the candle was guttering in a puddle of its own wax before Uncle Trump rose from his knees and pulled Manfred up with him. Go to your bed now, Yong. We have done all we can to save your soul for the time being. He watched while Manfred undressed and slipped under the grey blanket. Then he asked quietly, if I forbade you to go to Windhoek in the morning, would you obey me? My father, whispered Manfred. Answer me, Yong. Would you obey me? I don't know, Uncle Trump, but I don't think I could. My pa, you have so much to repent already. It would not do to add the sin of disobedience to your load. Therefore, I place no such restriction upon you. You must do what loyalty and your conscience dictate. But for your own sake and mine, when you reach Windhoek, use the name of Beerman, not Delaray, Yong. Do you hear me? Judgment today, I make a rule never to predict the outcome of any piece of legislation or judicial process. A.B. Abrahams announced from his chair, facing Santaine Courtney's desk. However, today I break my own rule. I predict that the man will get the rope. No question about it. How can you be that certain, A.B.? Santaine asked quietly, and Aby looked at her with covert admiration for a moment before replying. She was wearing a simple, low-waisted dress, which could justify its expense only by its exquisite cut and the fineness of the silk jersey material. It showed off her fashionable small bosom and boyishly slim hips as she stood against the French windows. The bright, white African sunlight behind her formed a nimbus about her head, and it took an effort to look away from her, 
and to concentrate on the burning cheroot, which he held up to enumerate his points. Firstly, the small matter of guilt. Nobody, not even the defence, has made any serious attempt to suggest anything other than he is guilty as all hell. Guilty in intention and execution. Guilty of planning it in detail and carrying it out as planned. Guilty of all manner of aggravating circumstances, including attacking and robbing a military remount depot, firing on the police, and wounding one of them with a grenade. The defence has as good as admitted their only hope will be to pull some arcane technical rabbit from the legal hat to impress his lordship, a hope which so far has not materialised. Sontaine sighed. She had spent two days in the witness stand. Though she had remained calm and unshakable in the face of the most rigorous and aggressive cross-examination, she was exhausted by it and haunted by a sense of culpability, of having driven Lothar to that desperate criminal folly, and now guilty of heading the pack that was pulling him down and would soon rend him with all the vindictiveness that the war allowed. Secondly, Aby weighed the cheroot, the man's record. During the war he was a traitor and a rebel, with a price on his head, a desperado with a long string of violent climbs to his discredit. He was pardoned for his wartime crimes, Santaine pointed out, a full pardon signed by the Prime Minister and the Minister of Justice. Still they will count against him, A.B. wagged his head knowingly. Even the pardon will make it worse for him, biting the hand of mercy, flouting the dignity of the law. The judge won't like that, believe me. A.B. inspected the end of the cheroot. It was burning evenly with a firm inch of grey ash, and he nodded approvingly. Thirdly, he went on, the man has shown no remorse, not a jot nor a shred of it. He has refused to tell anybody what he did with the filthy loot. He broke off as he saw Santaine's distress at the mention of the missing diamonds, and continued hurriedly. Fourthly, the emotional aspects of the crime, attacking a lady of the highest standing in the community. He grinned suddenly. A helpless female, so unable to defend herself that she bit his arm off. She frowned and he became serious again. Your own courage and integrity will count heavily against him. Your dignity in the witness box. You have seen the newspapers. Joan of Arc and Florence Nightingale in one person. The veiled suggestion that his attack upon you might have been more dastardly and beastly than modestly will allow you to tell. The judge will want to reward you with the man's head on a platter. She looked at her wristwatch. The court will reconvene in forty minutes. We should go up the hill, she said. Aby stood up immediately. I love to watch the law in operation, the dignified and measured pace of it, the trappings and ritual of it, the slow grinding of evidence, the sorting of the chaff from the wheat. Not now, Aby. She stopped him as she adjusted her hat in the mirror above the mantel, draping the black veil over one eye, setting the small brim at an elegant angle, and then picking up her crocodile-skin handbag and tucking it under her arm. Without any further oratory from you, let's just go and see this awful thing through. They drove up the hill in Aby's Ford. The press was waiting for them in front of the courthouse, thrusting their cameras into the open window of the Ford and blinding Sontaine with bursting flashbulbs. She shielded her eyes with her handbag, but the moment she stepped out of the automobile, they were around her in a pack, yelling their questions. What will you feel if they hang him? What about the diamonds? Can your company survive without them, Mrs. Courtney? 
Do you think they'll do a deal for the diamonds? What are your feelings? Aby ran interference for her, barging his way through the crowd, dragging her by the wrist into the comparative quiet of the courthouse. Wait here for me, Aby, she ordered, and slipped away down the passageway. Weaving through the crowd that was waiting for the doors of the main courtroom to open. Heads turned to watch her, and a buzz of comment followed her down the passage, but she ignored it, and turned the corner towards the ladies' toilets. The office set aside for the defence was directly opposite the ladies' room, and Sontaine glanced around to make sure she was unobserved, then turned to that door, tapped upon it sharply, pushed it open, and stepped inside. She shut the door behind her, and as the defence counsel looked up. She said, "Excuse this intrusion, gentlemen, but I must speak to you." Aby was still waiting where she had left him, when Sontaine returned only minutes later. Colonel Malcolmess is here, he told her, and all her other preoccupations were forgotten for the moment. Where is he? She demanded eagerly. She had not seen Blaine since the second day of the trial, when he had given his evidence in that ringing tenor lilt that raised the fine hair on the back of Sontaine's neck. Evidence that was all the more damning for its balanced, unemotional presentation. The defence had tried to trip him on his description of the shooting of the horses and the grenade attack, but had swiftly sensed that he would provide little for their comfort. And let him leave the stand after a few futile minutes of cross-examination. Since then, Sontaine had looked for him unavailingly each day. Where is he? She repeated. He has gone in already. Aby replied, and Sontaine saw that while she had been away, the ushers had opened the double doors to the main courtroom. Charlie is holding seats for us. No need to join the scrum. Aby took her arm and eased her through the moving crowd. The ushers recognised her, and helped clear the aisle for her to reach the seats in the third row that Aby's assistant was holding for them. Sontaine was covertly searching through the bustle for Blaine's tall form, and she started when the press of bodies opened for a moment and she saw him. On the opposite side of the aisle, he was searching also, and saw her a moment later. His reaction was as sharp as hers had been. They stared at each other from a few yards that seemed to Sontaine to be an abyss wide as an ocean. Neither of them smiled as they held each other's eyes. Then the crowd in the aisle intervened once again, and she lost sight of him. She sank down in the seat beside Aby, and made a little show of searching in her handbag to give herself time to recover her composure. Here he is, Aby exclaimed. And for a moment, she thought he was referring to Blaine. Then she saw that the warders were bringing Lothar de la Rey through from the cells. Although she had seen him in the dock for every one of the last five days. She was still not hardened to the change in him. Today, he wore a flayed, faded blue workman's shirt and dark slacks. The clothes seemed too large for him, and one sleeve was pinned up loosely over his stump. He shuffled like an old man, and one of the warders had to help him up the steps into the dock. His hair was completely white now; even his thick, dark eyebrows were laced with silver. He was impossibly thin, and his skin had a greyish, lifeless look. It hung in little loose folds under his jaw, and on his scrawny neck. His tan had faded to the yellowish colour of old putty. As he sank onto the bench in the dock, he lifted his head and searched the gallery of the court. There was a pathetic anxiety in his, his expression, 
as he ran his eyes swiftly over the packed benches. Then Santaine saw the little flare of joy in his eyes and his masked smile as he found what he was seeking. She had watched this scene enacted every morning for five days, and she twisted in her seat and looked up at the gallery behind her. But from where she sat, the angle was wrong. She could not see who or what had attracted Lothar's attention. Silence in court, the usher called, and there was a shuffling and scrabbling as the body of the court came to its feet, and Judge Hawthorne led his two assessors to their seats. He was a silver-haired little man with a benign expression and lively, sparkling eyes behind his pince-nez. He looked more like a schoolmaster than the hanging judge that A.B. said he was. Neither he nor his assessors wore wigs or the colourful robes of the English courts. Roman Dutch law was more sombre in its trappings. They wore simple black gowns and white swallow-tailed neckties, and the three of them conferred quietly, inclining their heads together while the body of the court settled down, and the coughing and throat-clearing and foot-shuffling abated. Then Judge Hawthorne looked up and went through the formality of convening the court, and the charge sheet was read over once again. Now an expectant hush fell over the courtroom. The reporters leaned forward with their notebooks poised. Even the barristers in the front row of benches were silenced and stilled. Lothar was expressionless but deathly pale as he watched the judge's face. Judge Hawthorne was concentrating on his notes, heightening the tension with subtle showmanship until it was barely supportable. Then he looked up brightly and launched without preliminaries into the delivery of his summation and judgment. First he detailed each of the charges, beginning with the most serious. Three counts of attempted murder, two of assault with intent to inflict grievous bodily harm, one of armed robbery. There were twenty-six charges in all, and it took almost twenty minutes for the judge to cover each of them. The prosecution has presented all these charges in an orderly and convincing manner. The red-faced prosecutor preened at the compliment, and Santaine felt an unreasonable irritation at this petty vanity. The judge went on. This court was particularly impressed with the evidence of the main prosecution witnesses. His Excellency, the administrator's testimony, was a great help to me and my assessors. We were most fortunate in having a witness of this caliber to relate the details of the pursuit and arrest of the accused, from which arise some of the most serious charges in this case. The judge looked up from his notes, directly at Blaine Malcolmus. I wish to record the most favorable impression that Colonel Malcolmus made upon this court, and we have accepted his evidence without reservation. <coughs> from where she was sitting... Sontaine could see the back of Blaine's head. The tips of his large ears turned pink as the judge looked at him, and Sontaine felt a rush of tenderness as she noticed. His embarrassment was somehow endearing and touching. Then the judge looked at her. The other prosecution witness who conducted herself impeccably and whose evidence was unimpeachable was Mrs. Santaine Courtney. The court is fully aware of the great hardship with which Mrs. Courtney had been inflicted and the courage which she has displayed, not only in this courtroom. Once again, we were most fortunate to have the benefit of her evidence in assisting us to reach our verdict. While the judge was speaking, Lothar de la Rey turned his head and looked at Santaine steadily. Those pale, accusing eyes disconcerted her, and she dropped her own gaze to the handbag in her lap to avoid them. The judge went on. In contrast, the defence was able to call only one witness, and that was the accused himself. After due consideration, we are of the opinion that much of the accused evidence was unacceptable. The witness's attitude was at times hostile and uncooperative. 
In particular, we reject the witness's assertion that the offences were committed single-handed and that he had no accomplices in their commission. Here the evidence of Colonel Malcolmus, of Mrs. Courtney and of the police troopers is unequivocal and collaborative. Luther de la Rey turned his head slowly in the judge's direction once more and stared at him with that flat, hostile expression which had so antagonised Judge Hawthorne over the five long days of the trial. And the judge returned his gaze levelly as he went on. Thus we have considered all the facts and the evidence presented to us and are unanimous in our verdict. On all 26 charges we find the accused, Luther de la Rey, guilty as charged. Luther neither flinched nor blinked, but there was a concerted gasp from the body of the court, followed immediately by a buzz of comment. Three of the reporters leapt up and scampered from the courtroom, and A.B. nodded smugly beside Sontaine. <clears throat> I told you, the rope, he murmured. He will swing for sure. The ushers were attempting to restore order. The judge came to their assistant. He rapped his gavel sharply and raised his voice. I will not hesitate to have this court cleared, he warned, and once again a hush settled over the courtroom. Before passing sentence, I will listen to any submissions in mitigation that the defence may wish to put to the bench. Judge Hawthorne inclined his head towards the young barrister charged with the defence, who immediately rose to his feet. Lothar de la Rey was destitute and unable to afford his own defence. Mr. Reginald Osmond had been appointed by the court to defend him. Despite his youth and inexperience, it was his first defence on a capital charge, Osmond had thus far acquitted himself as well as could have been expected, given the hopeless circumstances of his client's case. His cross-examination had been spirited and nimble, if ineffectual, and he had not allowed the prosecution to make any gratuitous gains. He said, If it please, my lord, I should like to call a witness to give evidence in mitigation. Come now, Mr. Osmond, said the judge. Surely you don't intend to introduce a witness at this stage? Do you have any precedence for this? The judge frowned. Osmond replied, I respectfully commend your lordship to the matter of the Crown versus Van der Spuy, 1923, and to the Crown versus Alexander, 1914. The judge conferred for a few moments with his assessors, and then looked up with a stagey sigh of exasperation. Very well, Mr. Osmond, I am going to allow you your witness. Thank you, my lord. Mr. Osmond was so overcome with his own success that he stuttered a little as he blurted eagerly, I could call Mrs. Sontaine de Thierry Courtney to the stand. This time there was a stunned silence. Even Judge Hawthorne fell back in his tall carved chair before a buzz of surprise and delight and anticipation swept through the court. The press were standing to get a view of Santaine as she rose, and from the gallery a voice called, Put the noose around the bastard's neck, love! Judge Hawthorne recovered swiftly, and his eyes flashed behind his pince-nez as he glared up at the gallery, trying to identify the wag. I will not tolerate a further outburst. There are severe penalties for contempt of court, he snapped, and even the journalists sat down again hurriedly and chastened applied themselves to their notepads. The usher handed Santaine into the witness stand, and then swore her, while every man in the room, including those on the bench, watched, most of them in open admiration, but a few, including Blaine and Abraham Abrahams, with puzzlement and perturbation. Mr. Osmond stood to open his examination, his voice pitched low with nervous respect. 
Mrs. Courtney. Will you please tell the court how long you have known the accused? He corrected himself hurriedly, for now Lothar de la Rey was no longer merely accused. He had been convicted. The prisoner. I have known Lothar de la Rey for nearly fourteen years. Santaine looked across the room at the stooped grey figure in the dock. Would you be good enough to describe in your own words the circumstances of your first meeting? It was in 1919. I was lost in the desert. I had been a castaway on the skeleton coast after the sinking of the Protea Castle. For a year and a half, I had been wandering in the Kalahari Desert with a small group of sand bushmen. All of them knew the story. At the time, it had been a sensation. But now, Sontaine's narrative, related in her French accent, brought it all vividly to life. She conjured up the desolation and misery, the fearful hardships and loneliness that she had endured, and the room was deathly quiet. Even Judge Hawthorne was hunched down in his chair, supporting his chin on his clenched fist, absolutely still as he listened. They were all with her as she struggled through the clinging sand of the Kalahari, dressed in the skins of wild animals, her infant son on her hip, following the tracks of a horse, a shod horse, the first sign of civilized man that she had encountered in all those desperate months. They chilled with her and shared her despair as the African night fell across the desert and her chances of succour receded. They willed her onwards through the darkness, seeking the glow of a camp fire far ahead, then started in horror as she described the sinister shape, dark with menace, that suddenly confronted her, and flinched as though they also had heard the roar of a hungry lion close at hand. Her audience gasped and stirred as she described her fight for her life and the life of her infant. The way the circling lion drove her up into the highest branches of a tall mapani and then climbed up towards her like a cat after a sparrow. Sandin described the sound of its hot, panting breath in the darkness and at last the shooting agony as the long yellow claws hooked into the flesh of her leg and she was drawn inexorably from her perch. She could not go on, and Mr. Osmond prompted her gently. Was it at this stage that Lothar de la Rey intervened? Santaine roused herself. I'm sorry, it all came back to me. Please, Mrs. Courtney, do not tax yourself. Judge Hawthorne rushed to her aid. I will recess the court if you need time. No, no, my lord. You are very kind, but that won't be necessary, she said. And she squared her shoulders and faced them again. Yes, that was when Lothar de la Rey came up. He had been camped close at hand and was alerted by the roars of the animal. He shot the lion dead while it was in the act of savaging me. He saved your life, Mrs. Courtney, said Osmond. He saved me from a dreadful death, and he saved my child with me. Mr. Osmond bowed his head in silence, letting the court savour the full drama of the moment. And then he asked gently, What happened after that, madam? I was concussed by my fall from the tree, the wound in my leg mortified. I was unconscious for many days, unable to care for myself or my son. And what was the prisoner's reaction to this? asked Osmond. He cared for me. He dressed my wounds, tended every need of mine and of my child. He saved your life a second time. Yes, she nodded. He saved me once again. Now, Mrs. Courtney, the years passed. 
you became a wealthy lady, a millionairess. Santaine was silent, and Osmond went on. Then, one day, three years ago, the prisoner approached you for financial assistance for his fishing and canning enterprise. Is that correct? He approached my company, said Santaine, Courtney Mining and Finance, for a loan. Osmond then led her through the series of events up to the time that she had closed down Lothar's canning factory. So, Mrs. Courtney, he finished, would you say that Lothar de la Rey had reason to believe that he had been unfairly treated, if not deliberately ruined, by your action? Santaine hesitated. My actions were at all times based on sound business principles. However, I would readily concede that, from Lothar de la Rey's standpoint, it could have seemed that my actions were deliberate. At the time, did he accuse you of attempting to destroy him? Osmond asked. She looked down at her hands and whispered something. I am sorry, Mrs. Courtney. I must ask you to repeat that. And she flared at him, her voice cracking with strain. Yes, damn it! He said I was doing it to destroy him. Mr. Osmond, the judge sat up straight, his expression severe. I must insist that you treat your witness in a more considerate fashion. He sank back in his seat, clearly moved by Santaine's recital, and then raised his voice again. I will recess the court for fifteen minutes to allow Mrs. Courtney time to recover herself. When they reconvened, Santaine entered the witness stand again and sat quietly while the formalities were completed and Mr. Osmond prepared to continue his examination. From the third row, Blaine Malcolmus smiled at her encouragingly and she knew that if she did not look away from him, every single person in the courtroom would be aware of her feelings. She forced herself to break contact with his eyes, and instead looked up at the gallery above his head. It was an idle glance. She had forgotten the way in which Lothar de la Rey searched the gallery each morning, but now she was seeing it from the same angle as he did from the dock. And suddenly... Her eyes flicked to the furthest corner of the gallery, drawn irresistibly by another set of eyes, by the intensity of a glowering gaze that was fastened upon her, and she started and then swayed in her seat, giddy with shock. For she had stared once again into Lothar's eyes, Lothar's eyes as they had been when first she met him, yellow as topaz, fierce and bright, with dark brows arched over them. Young eyes, unforgettable, unforgotten eyes. But the eyes were not set in Lothar's face, for Lothar sat across the courtroom from her, bowed and broken and grey. This face was young, strong and full of hatred, and she knew, she knew with a mother's sure instinct, she had never seen her younger son. At her insistence, he had been taken away, wet from the womb, at the very moment of birth, and she had turned her head away so as not to see his squirming naked body. But now she knew him, and it was as though the very core of her existence, the womb which had contained him, ached at this glimpse of his face and she had to cover her mouth to prevent herself crying out with the pain of it. Mrs. Courtney! Mrs. Courtney! The judge was calling her, his tone quickening with alarm, and she forced herself to turn her head towards him. Are you all right, Mrs. Courtney? Are you feeling well enough to continue? Thank you, my lord. I am quite well. Her voice seemed to come from a great distance, and it took all her willpower not to look back at the youth in the gallery, at her son, Manfred. Very well, Mr. Osmond, 
you may proceed. It required an enormous effort of will for Santaine to concentrate on the questions, as Osmond led her once more over the robbery and the struggle in the dry river bed. So then, Mrs. Courtney, he did not lay a finger upon you until you attempted to reach the shotgun. No, said Santaine. He did not touch me until then. You have already told us that you had the shotgun in your hand and were attempting to reload the weapon. That is correct. Would you have used the weapon if you had succeeded in reloading it? Yes. Can you tell us, Mrs. Courtney, would you have shot to kill? I object, my lord. The prosecutor sprang angrily to his feet. That question is hypothetical. Mrs. Courtney, you do not have to answer that question if you do not choose, Judge Hawthorne told her. I will answer, Santaine said clearly. Yes, I would have killed him. Do you think the prisoner knew that? asked the judge. My lord, I object, said the prosecutor. The witness cannot possibly know. Before the judge could rule, Santaine said clearly, He knew me. He knew me well. He knew I would kill him if I had the chance. The pent-up emotion of the courtroom exploded in ghoulish relish, and it was almost a minute before quiet could be restored. In the confusion, Santaine looked up at the corner of the high gallery again. It had taken all her self-control not to do so before. The corner seat was empty. Manfred had gone, and she felt confused by his desertion. Osmond was questioning her again, and she turned to him vaguely. I'm sorry, um, will you repeat that, please? I asked Mrs. Courtney, if the prisoner's assault on you, as you stood there with a shotgun in your hands intent on killing him, My lord, I object. The witness was intent only on defending herself and her property, the prosecutor howled. You'll have to rephrase that question, Mr. Osmond, said the judge. Very well, my lord. Mrs. Courtney, was the force that the prisoner used against you inconsistent with that needed to disarm you? I'm sorry. Santaine could not concentrate. She wanted to search the gallery again. I don't understand the question, she said. Did the prisoner use more force than that necessary to disarm you and prevent you shooting him? No. He simply pulled the shotgun away from me. And later, when you had bitten his wrist, when you had buried your teeth in his flesh, inflicting a wound that later would result in the amputation of his arm, did he strike you? or inflict any other injury upon you in retaliation? No. The pain must have been intense, and yet he did not use undue force upon you. No. She shook her head. He was... Sante in search for the word. He was strangely considerate, almost gentle... I see. And before he left you, did the prisoner make sure that you had sufficient water for survival? And did he give you advice concerning your well-being? He checked that I had sufficient spare water, and he advised me to stay with the wrecked vehicle until I was rescued. Now, Mrs. Courtney, Osmond hesitated delicately. There has been speculation in the press that the prisoner might have made um, some form of indecent assault. Sontaine interrupted him furiously. That suggestion is repugnant and totally false. Thank you, madam. I have only one more question. You knew the prisoner well. 
You accompanied him while he was hunting to provide meat for you and your child once he had rescued you. You saw him shoot. I did, said something. In your opinion, if the prisoner had wanted to kill you or Colonel Malcolmus or any of the police officers pursuing him, could he have done so? Lothar de la Rey is one of the finest marksmen I have ever known. He could have killed all of us on more than one occasion, said Santaine. I have no further questions, my lord, said Osmond. Judge Hawthorne wrote at length on the notepad before him and then tapped his pencil thoughtfully upon the desk for another few seconds before he looked up at the prosecutor. Do you wish to cross-examine the witness? he asked. The prosecutor came to his feet, scowling sulkily. I have no further questions for Mrs. Courtney. He sat down again, folded his arms, and stared angrily at the revolving punker fan on the ceiling. Mrs. Courtney, said the judge, the court is grateful to you for your further evidence. You may now return to your seat. Santaine was so intent on searching the gallery for her son that she tripped on the steps at the foot of the tiers of benches, and both Blaine and Aby jumped up to help her. Aby reached her first, and Blaine sank back into his seat as Aby led Santaine to hers. Aby, she whispered urgently. There was a lad in the gallery while I was giving evidence. Blonde, around thirteen years old, though he looks more like seventeen. His name is Manfred, Manfred de la Rey. Find him. I want to speak to him. Now? Aby looked surprised. Right now. The submission in mitigation. I'll miss it. Go, she snapped. Find him. And Aby jumped up, bowed to the bench, and hurried out of the courtroom, just as Mr. Reginald Osmond rose to his feet once again. Osmond spoke with passion and sincerity, using Santaine's evidence to full advantage and repeating her exact words. He saved me from a dreadful death, and he saved my child with me. Osmond paused significantly and then went on. The prisoner believed that he deserved the gratitude and generosity of Mrs. Courtney. He placed himself in her power by borrowing money from her, and he came to believe, mistakenly but genuinely, that his trust in her had been betrayed. His eloquent plea for mercy went on for almost half an hour. But Sontaine found herself thinking of Manfred rather than the plight of his father. The look which the boy had levelled at her from the gallery troubled her deeply. The hatred in it had been a palpable thing, and it resuscitated her sense of guilt, a guilt which she believed she had buried so many years before. He will be alone now. He will need help, she thought. I have to find him. I have to try and make it up to him in some way. She realized then why she had so steadfastly denied the boy over all these years, why she had thought of him only as Lothar's bastard, why she had gone to extreme lengths to avoid any contact with him. Her instinct had been correct. Just a single glimpse of his face, and all the defenses which she had built up so carefully came tumbling down. All the natural feelings of a mother which she had buried so deeply were revived to overwhelm her. Find him for me, A.B., she whispered, and then realized that Reginald Osmond had completed his submission with a final plea. Lothar de la Rey felt that he had been grievously wronged. As a result, he committed a series of crimes which were abhorrent and indefensible. However, my lord, many of his actions prove that he was a decent and compassionate man, 
caught up in stormy emotions and events too powerful for him to resist. His sentence must be severe. Society demands that much. But I appeal to your lordship to show a little of the same Christian compassion that Mrs. Courtney has displayed here today, and to refrain from visiting upon this hapless man, who has already lost one of his limbs, the extreme penalty of the law. 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 He sat down in a silence that lasted for many long seconds, until Judge Hawthorne looked up from the reverie into which he had sunk. Thank you, Mr. Osmond. This court will recess and reconvene at two o'clock this afternoon, at which time we will impose sentence. Sontaine hurried from the courtroom, searching eagerly for Aby or for another glimpse of her son. She found Aby on the front steps of the courthouse in deep conversation with one of the police guards. But he broke off and came to her immediately. Did you find him? she demanded anxiously. I'm sorry, Santaine. No sign of anyone of that description. I want the boy found and brought to me, Aby. Use as many men as you need. I don't care what it costs. Search the town, do everything possible to find him. He must be staying somewhere. All right, Santaine. I'll get on to it right away. You say his name is Manfred de la Rey. Then he will be related to the prisoner? His son, she said. I see. Aby looked at her thoughtfully. May I ask why you want him so desperately, Santaine? And what you are going to do with him when you find him? No, you may not ask. Just find him, she said. Why do I want him? She repeated Abe's question to herself wonderingly. Why do I want him after all these years? And the answer was simple and self-evident. Because he is my son. And what will I do with him if I find him? He is poisoned against me. He hates me. I saw that in his eyes. He does not know who I really am. I saw that also. So, what will I do when I meet him face to face? And she answered herself as simply. I don't know. I just do not know. The maximum penalty provided by law for the first three offences on the prisoner's charge sheet is death by hanging, said Judge Hawthorne. The prisoner has been found guilty of these and the further offences with which he has been charged. In the normal course of events, this court would have had no hesitation in inflicting that supreme penalty upon him. However, we have been given pause by the extraordinary evidence of an extraordinary lady. The submissions made voluntarily by Mrs. Santaine de Thierry Courtney are all the more remarkable for the fact that she has suffered most grievously at the prisoner's hands, physically, emotionally, and materially, and also for the fact that her admissions might be construed by small-minded and mean persons as invidious to Mrs. Courtney herself. In twenty-three years' service on the bench, I have never been privileged to witness such a noble and magnanimous performance in any courtroom, and our own deliberations must, by necessity, be tempered by Mrs. Courtney's example. Judge Hawthorne bowed slightly towards where Santaine sat, then took the pince from his nose and looked at Lothar de la Rey. The prisoner will rise, he said. Lothar de la Rey, you have been found guilty of all the various charges brought against you by the Crown, and for purpose of sentence, these will be taken as one. 
It is, therefore, the sentence of this court that you be imprisoned at hard labor for the rest of your natural life. For the first time since the beginning of the trial, Lothar de la Rey showed emotion. He recoiled from the judge's words. His face began to work, his lips trembling, one eyelid twitched uncontrollably, and he lifted his remaining hand, palm up, in appeal towards the dark-robed figure on the bench. Kill me, rather! A wild heart cry. Hang me, rather than lock me up like an animal! The warders hurried to him, seized him from either side, and led him, shaking and calling out piteously from the dock, while a hush of sympathy held the whole room. Even the judge was affected, his features set and grim, as he stood up and slowly led his assessors from the room. Santaine remained sitting, staring at the empty dock as the subdued crowd filed out of the double doors, like mourners leaving a funeral. Kill me, rather. She knew that plea would stay with her for the rest of her life. She bowed her head and covered her eyes with her hands. In the eye of her mind, she saw Lothar as he had been when she first met him, hard and lean as one of the red Kalahari lions, with pale eyes that looked to far horizons, shaded blue by distance. A creature of those great spaces, washed with white sunlight. And she thought of him now, locked in a tiny cell, deprived for the rest of his life of the sun and the desert wind. Oh, Lothar, she cried in the depths of her soul, how could something once so good and beautiful have ended like this? We have destroyed each other and destroyed also the child that we conceived in that fine noon of our love. She opened her eyes again. The courtroom had emptied, and she thought she was alone until she sensed a presence near her. And she turned quickly, and blame Malcolmus was there. Now I know how right it was to love you, he said softly. He stood behind her, his head bowed over her, and she looked up at him and felt the terrible regret and sorrow begin to lift. Blaine took her hand that lay along the back of the bench and held it between both of his. I have been struggling with myself all these last days since we parted, trying to find the strength never to see you again. I almost succeeded. But you changed it all by what you did today. Honour and duty and all those other things are no longer meaning anything to me when I look at you now. You are part of me. I have to be with you. When? she asked. As soon as possible, he said. Blaine, in my short life, I have done so much damage to others, inflicted so much cruelty and pain. No more. I also cannot live without you. But nothing else must be destroyed by our love. I want all of you, but I will accept less to protect your family. It will be hard, perhaps impossible, he warned her softly. But I accept your conditions. We must not inflict pain on others. Yet, I want you so much. I know, she whispered and stood up to face him. Hold me, Blaine, just for a moment. A.B. Abrahams was searching for Santaine through the empty passages of the courthouse. He reached the double doors of the courtroom and pushed one leaf open quietly. Santaine and Blaine Malcolmus stood in the aisle between the tiers of oak benches. 
they were in each other's arms, oblivious to anything around them. And he stared for a moment without comprehension, then softly closed the door again, and stood guard before it, racked by fear and happiness for her. You deserve love, he whispered. Pray God, this man can give it to you. Eden must have been like this, Santain thought, and Eve must have felt the way I do today. She drove slower than her usual frantic pace. Although her heart cried out for haste, she denied it to make the anticipation keener. I have been without sight of him for five whole months, she whispered. Five minutes longer will only make it sweeter when at last I am in his arms again. Despite Blaine's assurances and best intentions, the conditions that Santaine had placed upon them had prevailed. They had not been alone together since those stolen moments in the empty courtroom. During most of that time, they had been separated by hundreds of miles, Blaine shackled by his duties in Windhoek, Santaine and Veltevreden, fighting desperately day and night for the survival of her financial empire, which was now in its death throes. Stricken by the loss of the diamond shipment, no part of which had ever been recovered. In her mind, she compared it to the hunting arrow of Oa, the little yellow bushman. A tiny reed, frail and feather light, but tipped with virulent poison which not the greatest game of the African veldt could withstand. It weakened and slowly paralyzed the quarry, which first reeled and swayed on its feet then dropped and lay panting, unable to rise, waiting for the cold lead of death to seep through the great veins and arteries, or for the swift mercy stroke of the hunter. That is where I am now, she thought, down and paralysed, while the hunters close in on me. All these months... She had fought with all her heart and all her strength, but now she was tired. Tired to every last fibre of muscle and mind, sick tired to her bones. She looked up at the rear-view mirror above her head and hardly recognised the image that stared back at her with stricken eyes, dark with a heavy mascara of fatigue and despair. Her cheekbones seemed to gleam through the pale skin, and there were chiselled lines of exhaustion at the corners of her mouth. But today I will set despair aside. I won't think about it. Again, not for a minute. Instead, I will think of Blaine, and this magical display that nature has laid out for me. She had left Velt of Raiden at dawn, and was now 120 miles north of Cape Town driving through the vast treeless plains of Namaqualand, heading down to where the green Benguela current caressed Africa's rocky western shores, but she was not yet in sight of the ocean. The rains had come late this year, delaying the spring explosion of growth, so that although it was only weeks before Christmas, the veldt was ablaze with its royal show of colour. For most of the year these plains were dun and windswept, sparsely populated and uninviting. But now the undulating expanses were clothed in an unbroken mantle so bright and vividly coloured that it confused and tricked the eye. Wild blooms of fifty different varieties and as many hues covered the earth in banks and flocks and stands, massed together with their own kind, so that they resembled a divine patchwork quilt, so bright that they seemed to burn with an incandescent light that was reflected from the very heavens, and the eye ached with so much colour. Closer at hand, the earthen road, rough and winding, was the only reference point in this splendid chaos. 
and even it was soon obliterated by flowers. The twin tracks were separated by a dense growth of wild blooms that filled the middle ridge between them and swept the underside of the old ford with a soft rushing sound like the water of a mountain stream. As Sontaine drove slowly up another gentle undulation and stopped abruptly at the top. She switched off the engine. The ocean lay before her, its green expanse flecked with brilliant white and lapped by this other ocean of blazing blooms. Through the open window, the sea wind ruffled Santaine's hair and caused the fields of wild flowers to nod and sway in unison, keeping time to the swells of ocean beyond. She felt the care and terrible strain of those last months recede in the face of so much vibrant beauty, and she laughed spontaneously at the joy of it, and shaded her eyes from the glare of orange and red and sulphur-yellow flower banks, and searched the seashore eagerly. It's a shack, Blaine had warned her in his last letter, two rooms and no running water, an earth latrine and an open hearth. But I have spent my holidays there since a child, and I love it. I have shared with it nobody else since my father's death. I go there alone whenever I can. You will be the first. And he had drawn a map of the road to it. She picked it out immediately, standing on the edge of the ocean, perched upon the horn of rock where the shallow bay turned. The thatched roof had blackened with age, but the thick adobe walls were whitewashed as bright as the foam that curled out on the green sea, and a wisp of smoke smeared towards her from the chimney. Beyond the building she saw movement, and picked out a tiny human shape on the rocks at the edge of the sea, and suddenly she was desperate with haste. The engine would not fire, though she cranked the starter until the battery faltered. Merd and double merd! It was an old vehicle, used and abused by one of her under-managers on the estate, until she had commandeered it to replace the ruined Daimler. And now its failure was an unwelcome reminder of her financial straits, so different from when she had driven a new daffodil-yellow Daimler every year. She let off the handbrake, and let the Ford trundle down the slope, gathering speed until she jumped the clutch, and the engine started with a shudder and roar of blue smoke, and she flew down the hill and parked behind the whitewashed shack. She ran out onto the black rocks above the water, and the swaying beds of black-stemmed kelp that danced to the send of the sea, and she waved and shouted, her voice puny on the wind and the rumble of the ocean, but he looked up, and saw her, and came at a run, jumping from rock to slippery wet rock. He wore only a pair of khaki shorts, and he carried a bunch of live rock lobsters in one hand. His hair had grown since last she had seen him. It was damp and curly with sea salt, and he was laughing, his mouth open and his big teeth flashing whitely and he had grown a moustache. She wasn't sure whether she liked that, but the thought was lost in the tumult of her own emotions, and she ran to meet him and flung herself against his bare chest. Oh, Blaine, she sobbed. God, how I've missed you! Then she lifted her mouth to him. His face was wet with sea spray, and it was salty on his lips. His moustache prickled, she had been right first time. She didn't like it. But then he lifted her high and was running with her towards the shack. And she held him tightly with both arms around his neck, bouncing in his arms, jolted by his long strides, and laughing breathlessly with her own fierce need of him. Blaine sat on a three-legged stool in front of the open hearth on which a fire of milkweed burned and perfumed the air with its fragrant incense. Santaine stood before him, 
working up a lather in the china shaving mug with his badger hair brush, while Blaine complained. It took five months to grow, and I was so proud of it. He twirled the ends of his moustache for the last time. It's so dashing, don't you think? No, said Sontaine firmly. I do not. I'd prefer to be kissed by a porcupine. She bent over him and lathered both sides of his upper lip with a thick foam, and then stood back and surveyed her handiwork with a critical eye. Perched on the stool, Blaine was still stark naked from their lovemaking, and suddenly Santaine grinned wickedly. Before he could fathom her intentions or move to protect himself, she had stepped forward again and daubed his most intimate extremity with a white blob of lather from the brush. He looked down at himself, appalled. Him too? He demanded. That would be cutting off my nose to spite my own face. She giggled, or something like that. Then she put her head on one side and gave her considered opinion. The little devil looks a lot better with a moustache than you do. Careful with that adjective, little. He admonished her, and reached for his towel. Come along, old fellow. You don't have to put up with this disrespect. He wrapped the towel around his waist, and Santaine nodded. That's better. Now I can concentrate on the job without distraction. And she took up the cutthroat razor that lay ready on the tabletop, and stropped it on the leather with quick. Practiced strokes. Where did you learn that? I'm beginning to feel jealous," he said. "My papa," she explained. "I always trimmed his moustaches. Now, hold still." She took the tip of his large nose between thumb and forefinger and lifted it. For what we are about to receive. Blaine's voice was muffled by her grip on his nose. He closed his eyes and winced as the steel rustled over his upper lip. And a few moments later, Santaine stepped back and wiped the lather and hair from the blade, laid the razor aside, and came back to dry his upper lip, and then stroked the smooth skin with her fingertip. It looks better. It feels better. She told him, "But there is still the final test." And she kissed him. Hmm. She murmured her approval, and then, still without breaking the kiss, she wriggled around and sat on his lap. It went on for a long time, until she broke away and looked down. The towel had slipped. I say. Here comes the little moustache devil again, obviously spoiling for trouble. She reached down, and gently wiped away the last traces of lather from the tip. You see, even he looks a lot better, clean-shaven. Blaine stood up with her in his arms. I think it is time, woman, that you learn the hard way, that you can get away with just so much. And then we must establish who is the boss around here. And he carried her to the bunk against the far wall. Much later, they sat side by side, cross-legged on the bunk, with a single brightly coloured basuto blanket draped over their bare shoulders, leaning together, and watching the fire shadows flicker along the rough plastered walls. Listening to the wind off the ocean, soughing around the eaves of the thatched roof in the darkness outside, cupping their hands around steaming mugs of fish soup. One of my specialities, Blaine had boasted, and it was thick with chunks of fresh galjon fish and lobster that he had caught that day. Wonderful powers of rejuvenation for those suffering from overexertion. Blaine recharged the mugs twice, for they were both ravenous. And then Santaine went to the fire, 
her naked body gleaming in the ruddy glow of the firelight, to bring him a smouldering twig to light his cheroot. When it was burning evenly, she climbed under the blanket again and snuggled against him. Did you ever find that young boy you were looking for? he asked lazily. A.B. Abrahams came to me for help, you know. He was unaware how the question had affected her, for she controlled the reflex stiffening of her body and simply shook her head. No, he disappeared. He was Lothar de la Rey's son. I deduced that. Yes, she agreed. I was worried about him. He must have been deserted and alone after his father's sentence. I'll keep looking for him, Blaine promised, and let you know if anything comes up. He stroked her hair. You are a kind person, he murmured. There was no reason why you should concern her, yourself with the boy. They were silent again. But reference to the outside world had broken the spell and started a trail of thought that was unpleasant but had to be followed to the end. How is Isabella? she asked and felt the muscles of his chest tighten and swell beneath her cheek. But he inhaled a puff from the cheroot before he answered. Her condition is deteriorating. Atrophy of the nerves of her lower body. Ulceration. She has been in Grootshaw Hospital since Monday. The ulcers at the base of her spine will not heal. I am sorry, Blaine. That is how I have managed to get away these few days. The girls are with their grandmother. That makes me feel awful, she said. I would feel worse if I couldn't see you, he replied. Blaine, we must keep to our resolution, she said. We must never hurt her or the girls. He was silent again, and then abruptly he flicked the stub of the cheroot across the room into the fire. It looks as though she will have to go to England. There is a surgeon at Guy's Hospital who has performed miracles. When? Her heart felt like a cannonball in her chest, suffocating her with its weight. Before Christmas. It depends on the tests they are doing now. You will have to go with her, of course, she said. That would mean resigning as administrator and damaging my chances. He broke off. He had never discussed his ambitions with her. Your chances of a place in a future cabinet and possibly one day the premiership, she finished for him. He stirred, taking her face between his hands and turning it gently so he could look into her eyes. You knew? he asked, and Sante nodded. Do you think that cruel of me? he asked, that I could let Isabella go on her own for my selfish ambitions. No, she said seriously. I know about ambition. I offered, he said, while unquiet shadows clouded the green of his eyes. Isabella would not accept it. She insisted that I stay here. He laid her head back against his chest and stroked the hair back from her temple. She is an extraordinary person, he went on. Such courage. The pain is almost unceasing now. She cannot sleep without laudanum, and always more pain and more laudanum. It makes me feel guilty, Blaine, but no matter what, I am glad for the opportunity to be with you. I am taking nothing from her. But that was not true, and she knew it. She lay awake long after he was asleep. She lay with her ear pressed to his chest 
and listened to his heart and the slow filling and emptying of his lungs. When she woke, he was dressed in the old pair of khaki shorts and taking down a bamboo fishing rod with an old Scarborough reel from the rack on the wall above the hearth. Breakfast in twenty minutes, he promised, leaving her cuddled down in the bunk. But he was back before then, carrying a gleaming gun metal and silver fish almost as long as his arm. He arranged it on a grid over the embers and then came to her and pulled the blanket off. Swim! He grinned sadistically, and she screamed. You are crazy! It's freezing! I'll die of pneumonia! She protested as wildly all the way down to the deep rock-lined pool in which he had dunked her.